All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 11, Section 5, Free Soil or Slave, The Dilemma of the West. So let's recall that a series of events have taken place in the West that led to a revival in this issue of free and slave states. This really hasn't been a national question since Missouri and Missouri statehood, but the Missouri Compromise settled that issue. However, here you had war with Mexico, which then led to California being added to the US. You add on top of that the gold rush, which meant that everybody moved to California and now California is ready to become a state. And so the question now for California is, will California be a free state or will California be a slave state? And this pushes, once again, this issue of slavery in the Western territories, this time in California, to the forefront of American politics. So one effort by Northerners to prevent the spread of slavery in territory acquired through the war with Mexico was the Wilmot Proviso, which proposed to ban slavery in the Mexican session. Again, the Mexican session was the land that the United States got from its war with Mexico, including California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The House of Representatives approved it, so they passed the Wilmot Proviso. At this time, the House of Representatives, being based off of population, has a larger population, at least over time, it's growing. The Senate rejected the Wilmot Proviso. And so this effort by Northerners in Congress to essentially ban slavery in the Western Territory did not work. And this is foreshadowing the deepening divide in the country between the North and South, between the free states and the slave states. The second party system was also torn apart on this issue. You had Whigs and Democrats, and within each party, you had, you know, let's just go to make a, a, a graph here, right? You know, you had Whigs. How do I want to do this? Whigs and Democrats. Now they're both political, right? They're political parties. And so you would assume that loyalty is to the party. Like today we have our Democrats and Republicans. And increasingly, what you found was instead not for the parties to be united along party lines, but instead to be united upon um, sectional lines. So increasingly, Northerners and Southerners, whether they belong to the Whig or the Democratic Party, uh, agreed on things like the Wilmot Proviso. So all Northerners, Whig or Democrat, wanted to see free soil. Uh, vice versa for Southerners, they wanted to see slave soil. They rejected the Wilmot Proviso. So this is a beginning of what we call the breakdown of the second party system. All right, the beginning of the breakdown of it. Instead, you have new parties being created. So this is a new anti-slavery party. And this distinction, this distinction anti-slavery is important because there's a difference between anti-slavery and abolitionism. Abolitionism means to completely and immediately abolish slavery. We might say for humane reasons. In other words, the abolitionists believe that enslaved blacks in the United States should be free because number one, that's what the Declaration of Independence states, but also number two, that's what Christianity states. And so they want to do it for humane reasons. The abolitionists recognize the humanity of slaves. Those who are anti-slavery don't necessarily oppose slavery for that particular reason. They oppose slavery for the economic reasons, mostly the way that slavery hurts white farmers, right? So wherever somewhere slavery is legal, essentially white farmers aren't going to be able to find work because slaves will be uh, bought in order and forced to do that work. So. Those who uh, support this anti-slavery position do so more, more so for economic reasons, and they're the ones who mainly are opposing the expansion of um, uh, the expansion of slavery in the U.S. The abolitions uh, or the abolitionists have a very kind of long ways to go here, uh, and so when the election of 1848 was held, this question of the Mexican Cession 
believed to be in the balance and parties began to split up. The Democratic Party broke into two factions. The bar barn burners were your anti-slavery faction led by Martin Van Buren, and your hunkers were the pro-slavery faction. Uh, some sought to try and seek a compromise, this idea of popular sovereignty. And I'm going to draw it here in a different color because it's an important idea that comes up, is kind of a middle ground. You know, can a middle ground be found? And essentially what popular sovereignty states is it says, let the states vote on the legality of slavery, right? So popular sovereignty states, let the states vote on the legality of slavery. So rather than Congress trying to decide, right? And in Congress, you have members of Northern states, right? So you have representatives from Massachusetts and representatives from Georgia they're not going to agree on whether or not states, uh, states should be slave or free, right? North is going to want free, South is going to want slave. Popular sovereignty is somewhat of a middle ground. It's kind of like a compromise. Say, look, let's just let the people in those states decide. So if popular sovereignty were to be used in this case, well, just let the people of California vote on it. And this idea of popular sovereignty becomes increasingly, um, increasingly popular, right? Uh, however, though, the further breakdown of the Whig and Democratic Party continues. The Free Soil Party combines anti-slavery factions in the U.S. It's not quite powerful enough to break the two-party duopoly in the political system, but the Free Soil Party is way more popular than the Liberty Party. So you're beginning to see more and more people join on this party on just one single issue, right, which is the expansion of slavery overseas. Northerners were worried about what they called slave power, that is the power of slave states, that if you don't check that, then slavery could potentially expand to everywhere in the United States. And in 1848, the United States elected Zachary Taylor, who was a Whig, but most importantly was a war hero. Uh, was a slave owner himself, but really had no strong opinion, right? So no strong opinion on slavery in the Western Territory. So you really get kind of a lack of leadership from the president. Instead, it's Congress that is set to figure this out. And the Compromise of 1850 is finally what Congress decides on. It takes a little bit of time for them to figure out, but it is eventually the, um, the compromise that decides this question here, right? And of course, the question is whether or not California is going to be a free state or whether or not California is going to be a slave state. Now, the Compromise of 1850 was in part helped to put together by Henry Clay. Uh, he is the old compromising candidate. He was the one who was able to get the United States out of the tariff crisis. We might also want to add on top of this Stephen Douglas. He is an a, a new guy to Congress, but he's becoming increasingly popular as a mediator between Northerners and Southerners who can't get along. But the Compromise of 1850 is way more complicated than the Missouri Compromise because there are a, a lot of different moving pieces. So here's what it sets out. Here's the Compromise. California is a free state. That was mostly because the people in California voted. It wasn't left up to popular sovereignty, but the people of California wrote their own constitution. They didn't wait for Congress, and they uh, opted for the free for a free state. Uh, the difference between California and other states like Missouri and Texas was that there were, were really no slaves in California, as compared to Texas and Missouri, which when those became states, there were lots of slaves in those areas. Utah and New Mexico, that is the other territory that the United States acquired via uh, the war with Mexico. The status of slavery there would be determined by popular sovereignty. So when those states were ready to join the union, they're just going to let the people out there vote. And whenever they vote, Congress says they'll agree to, uh, to accept whatever it is. In Washington, D.C., that's the nation's capital, located in Virginia and Maryland, two slave states. But because northerners go there to work, uh, southerners agreed to ban the slave trade 
what the South gets is a new stricter and stronger fugitive slave law. A fugitive slave is a runaway. So one of the main concerns for Southerners was that runaway slaves were escaping to the free states and they weren't being returned. And so Southerners wanted a stronger law. And pretty much when you boil down the Compromise of 1850, these are kind of like the two main parts. Northerners get the free state of California. Southerners get a new and stronger fugitive or runaway slave law. Finally, the border between Texas and New Mexico was settled. Uh, that was rather a minor part of it. But in order for Northerners and Southerners to agree, all of these criteria had to be met. And, and for those criteria actually to be met, the Compromise of 1850 was hailed and was celebrated as the compromise that saved the Union, right? The compromise that saved the Union. It was celebrated at the time. Now, of course, what we know today that they don't know now is, in fact, the United States is 10 years away from breaking apart and experiencing the bloodiest conflict in American history.